Jesus taught us this important lesson. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. If you flip to the back of your Bible, there's a book called Revelation. That's a little bit different. If you're not real familiar with it, it's, it's a strange book. It's like post-apocalyptic. It's kind of sci-fi in nature. It's really strange. Lots of people are confused by it. In fact, it's probably the most debated book in the Bible to this day. And so knowing that, I'd like to sum it all up in one sentence. Right? That seems like a wise thing to do. Okay, so here it is. The basic gist of the book is this. He who overcomes wins. That's it. And it's, it's very strange that I would try to sum it up that simply, but that's it, all right? And the whole book is written for people who feel tempted to walk away from Jesus. They feel tempted to, to kind of leave it behind and, and go on. There's pressures outside. There's pressures from within. They've accepted Jesus. They followed him, but the pressure's built too much, and the temptation for them is to walk away. And it all kind of crescendos in chapter 21, verse 7, where it says, he who overcomes wins. He who overcomes, he who doesn't fall back, he who doesn't give up, the, the ones who stay firm, the ones who, who, who stay present, the ones who don't back down, they win. And what they win is the blessing of Jesus. It's the, it's the promise of an inheritance that they would overcome all of this world, that they would have eternity with him. It's incredible. And then the next verse says, who doesn't overcome? Verse 7 is all positive. It's all really good. It's he who overcomes. Verse 8 gives us a list of who doesn't overcome. Now, before we look at the list, I want you to imagine in your mind, who is that? Who is it that doesn't overcome? Who is it that won't receive the inheritance of Jesus, right? And I want you to think through in your mind, who are those people? What are those kinds of things? What kind of things would you look at? Because there's a list and we're going to look at it. But before we look at it, I want you to think through and try to come up with what your list would be. How would you categorize the people who are not overcomers? All right, you got a couple ideas going? All right, this is the list. It's Revelation 21, verse 8, and it starts with this. Now, the first one I have left as a blank because that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so here's where we're going. But the rest of the list says the faithless, degenerates, murderers, sex peddlers and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars. For them, it's lake, fire, and brimstone, second death. It's really harsh, especially coming after verse 7. It's kind of strange, very contrasting, all right? And so we have faithless. This would be like the unbelieving. Degenerates, that's a, that's a fun word. Uh, it, it's, if you were translated a different way, you might find the word vile. It, it means uh, it means there's a stench, there's a putridness to their lives, that God doesn't even like the smell of their lives in his nostrils, right? Murderers and sex peddlers and sorcerers, that's fun, that feels like that comes out of left field, right? It's the people who, who just find a little bit too much enjoyment in celebrating the things of Satan, okay? And most of us, I think, as we look at that list up to that word, we're probably feeling pretty comfortable about ourselves, all right? We're like, probably not big issues that we're dealing with within this church, but then the next two, idolaters and liars, for me at least, seems to get a little bit more personal. It's something that I think probably is a little bit more real. Now here's the deal. You thought of some things. You had some ideas of who you thought might end up on that list. What's not included? What's the word that's missing? Was there overlap in your list and within this list? All right? Like seriously, I want you to think. I don't want you to just consume what I'm saying. I want you to think. What would you put on this list? What's missing? Because I can come up with a long list of stuff that isn't in this list, right? Like I can think of thieves. I, I think of like child abusers, right? I, I, I have all sorts of different things that come to mind. I think of like addicts. I mean, what else would, would fit within this list? The Ten Commandments has a long list of things that aren't included in this list. What's the one word that's missing? It's cowards. It's the cowardly. 
That doesn't seem to fit in my mind. I don't know how you feel about that word, but it doesn't seem to fit in my mind. It seems to kind of be in contrast. Uh, does it really deserve to be listed next to murderers? Do cowards deserve to get placed right next to, to child abusers? I mean, it, it feels to me like it doesn't fit. And, and really what we're going to see here is that, that when we're talking about cowardly, we're talking about uh, this. It's, it's the fear that is symptomatic of unbelief. That's what coward is. And it fits with that second word, faithless. It's that when you're being a coward that you're, you're really unbelieving. That's the big issue. That's what we're going to unpack. And Revelation was written to people who were tempted to fall away, tempted to walk away, tempted to fall back. And they need to be encouraged. They need to know that there was danger in this. Pressures from within, pressures from with society. And God says that the cowardly are not overcomers. That they're losers. That they're not winners, but that they are losers. That it's categorically the same as murderers and idolaters and unbelieving. Now, in the early 90s to mid-90s, there was a uh, fad that went around, a, a clothing fad. It was this brand of clothing called No Fear. How many of you guys remember this? All right. If you were anywhere near my age, okay, so we're saying early to mid-90s, and you were a boy between 8 and 14 years old, I guarantee you had one of these shirts. Guaranteed. Everyone I knew had one of these shirts. I had a shirt similar to this. I couldn't find a good image that would show up really well for you to see, but it was this kind of a deal. It was no fear, and it would have this kind of a saying on there, and young boys would wear these around to make them look macho, all right? It made them look like they were cool. It made them look like they were these little miniature warriors. The reality is that they, they were all cowards, every single one of them. I know because I was one of them, right? They wore this. I played baseball for many years. I know that boys would rather watch a third strike without swinging than take a chance of swinging and missing, right? They're cowards, every single one of them. I know it. It's what it is. I, I, I lived with this. I, I remember in the cafeteria that there were boys who would walk on some sides of the cafeteria, but not both sides. Because on the other side of the cafeteria, that's maybe where that one girl was that they thought was kind of cute, but they didn't have the guts to be too close to her where she might actually talk to them, Right? Or, or maybe it was that kid that was going to bully them or push them around, and so they were scared they weren't going to go over there. Even as a small kid, I remember seeing this and recognizing the irony and the hypocrisy of these shirts, all of us walking around wearing them like we were. It was embarrassing, wasn't it? And I was probably the worst of all. I had guts on the baseball field, but I didn't have enough guts to walk down the dark hallway to get to my bedroom at night. That wasn't a joke. That was confession. All right? Like, that's real, okay? That's who I was. And look, we can sit here and we can talk about fear. We can talk about snakes and spiders. We can talk about roller coasters, all right? All the things that we're scared of. I'll tell you that this week I am scared of Alabama. They're coming. They're, Alabama's taking a trip to Austin, Texas next week. It's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be so, I don't know if I even want to watch it. I'm scared, all right? And Texas wants to join the SEC. It's dumb. It's a bad idea. All right, like it's just not good. I'm scared, but big deal, right? Fear can be something more than that too. And you know that I don't know anyone who isn't scared of losing a friend. I don't know anyone who isn't scared of that. I don't know anyone who is, who is fearful of being rejected. Everyone I know has a fear of rejection. Everybody I know is terrified of, of being hated. This whole fear thing, it's, it's real. I don't, I don't know anyone who isn't scared of the future. And that might be your kids. It might be this country. It might be your retirement and this economy. But I don't know anyone who isn't scared of it. Right? This whole fear thing, it, it's, it's big. And this isn't, this isn't a standalone sermon about courage or fear. This fits directly into the middle of what we're talking about in this series called Being the Bad Guys. Uh, if you recall, a couple weeks ago, Doc laid out rival strategies. That as Christians find themselves more and more the bad guys in this culture, that they're going to find, you know, things coming up against them, that there's ways that we respond. That there's ways that we just naturally are inclined to respond. And one of those was that we fight. You remember him talking about this? Remember this? That sometimes we fight, sometimes we push back. We, we think in our minds that if we just have the right arguments, if somehow we could just win people's minds, that it eventually would lead their hearts. 
And, and so we, we fight, we engage in battles thinking that we can overcome and that we can win. And that sometimes we don't fight, but sometimes we flight. Sometimes we run, sometimes we hide, and we create these little communities where we go off and we just kind of, kind of just rally around each other, and we, we work to preserve Christianity, but we go and we hide. It's oftentimes what churches do on Sunday mornings. They come into a building and they hide from the rest of the world. And then sometimes we compromise. Sometimes in order to have peace, we, we, just, we, we change the things that we believe or we compromise our own convictions just so that we can get along with people and live at peace. You know that every single one of those is a response of fear? We didn't necessarily use that language too much a couple weeks ago when Doc introduced all that, but every single one of those responses is a response of fear. Fear causes us to fight. We have this idea that we can just control what's in front of us, that if we just grab tighter and we try harder, that we can force our present into what we want it to be and that we can affect the future. That's fear. That's guiding and directing our actions. It's the same with flight, this fear that we're going to be overrun, and so we go and we hide. Same with compromise. We're afraid of being hated or rejected or losing a friend, and so we compromise what it is we believe so that we can live at peace with people. And then Doc gave us a fourth option. He, he said that there's a fourth option. It comes from Jesus, and he said that you can be salt and light, that you can live lightly was one of the phrases we use, but that you could live as salt and light. And then last week, Doc laid out what that looks like practically. It's love. It's a different strategy. It's unique. It's not one maybe that you would have expected, but, but it, it calls us to love, and love requires great courage. And that's why we're going to talk about it today. In John chapter 13, if you recall last week, Doc talked about this phrase from verse 35 where Jesus says to love one another. You remember that? You should remember it if you're here. If you weren't, go back and watch it. But if you're here, you should remember it because we kept looking at it. We kept bringing that verse up through the whole series and repeated it because Jesus repeated it. Now, I want you to understand the larger context of what happened when Jesus said these words. It's so crucial that we understand what was happening in this moment specifically in history, okay? In time and space. When Jesus uses these words and he says, love one another, what he's doing is he's talking to a group of 11 men who he loves dearly, and within the next 24 hours, he will have already been pulled off of a cross and placed in a tomb. This is the last night of his life. This is his last time to sit down with these men and communicate things, and the thing that he communicated over and over and over again was love one another. It was that important. And the people in the room tell you how Jesus lived it out. There's a guy in the room named Judas who betrayed Jesus. In fact, that very night, Jesus looked at Judas and told him, I know what you're doing, go do it. And Judas gets up and leaves. I mean, I can't imagine how awkward that was in the room, right? But he gets up and he leaves. Before that moment, before, Ju before Judas is, is sent on his way to go do what he's going to do, when Jesus knows what he's up to, before that moment, Jesus washed his feet. Jesus took time and cleaned the feet of a man who would swear to be his enemy just moments later. And that same night, they sit down around a table and they're sharing a meal and they're celebrating this Passover feast. It should be this happy time. Jesus lets Judas sit at the table. When Jesus says these words, when he says love one another, this isn't some facade, this isn't some philosophy, this isn't some theory. This is exactly who he is. That regardless of whatever he faced, he responded to it with love. And so he says it in John 13, but then in 15 he says it again, and he says it again. He repeats it over and over again. Now we hear John 15, that sounds like maybe several days, no, this is hours, this is, this is minutes. All of this is happening right there together. And then in John 18, just, it's, it's five chapters later from 13 where we start, but we're talking hours. It may be less than five hours. The, the account we have of this last night is so in-depth. Jesus and his disciples, they leave the upper room and they go off onto a hill where Jesus is praying. And he is distraught because he knows what's coming. And he's anxious and he's worried and he wants to be faithful to his father. And so we find him praying very earnestly. And then Judas arrives with a troop of soldiers. And when they do, Peter grabs a sword and slashes at one of them taking off their ear. Are you familiar with the story? And I want you to see what's happened here, okay? Peter was caught off guard. He was surprised. 
It's not what he anticipated. And this blows my mind because he's sitting in the room when Jesus tells Judas to go do what he started. And then Judas shows up with soldiers and Peter's like, oh, I can't believe it. All right. And so he freaks out. He's caught off guard and he responds in fear. This isn't what he expected. It's not what he anticipated. So he responds in fear and he responds with fighting, which leads him to a sword. And by the end of the story, Jesus has reprimanded Peter in front of everybody. He's taken the ear, he's healed the man, and then hands himself over to be arrested and go into jail where eventually he would be murdered. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, this way of love changes how we interact in every single situation. Peter isn't greatly deterred. He's confused. It doesn't make much sense. But he kind of sneaks around in the shadows and he follows Jesus into where this sham of a trial takes place in the middle of the night. They bring in all these, uh, these religious leaders and they're going to have this trial, but they've already decided that they're going to murder Jesus. It doesn't matter. He's already convicted guilty. And, and they bring him in this whole thing. Peter goes and stands in a courtyard outside where he can kind of see and he can kind of hear what's going on. And while he's out there, he finds a fire where he's warming up. You remember the story? And there's two guys out in this courtyard and they recognize him. One of them asks him, he says, aren't you one of Jesus' friends? And he says, no. A second guy asks, he says no. A third one, this is my favorite, a young girl. Now, what is a young girl (laughs) doing in this place in the middle of the night? It doesn't make sense to me. It's very strange. But a little girl sees him, recognizes him as a follower of Jesus, and asks him, aren't you one of his friends? And he denies it. Fear leads him to flight, and it leads him to lie. You see what happens when we get this wrong? When we experience fear and we respond in the wrong ways, when we're caught off guard, we respond in those wrong ways and we find ourselves far from what it is that Jesus has said. Hours before, Jesus had clearly communicated love one another. That's the strategy. And here we are just a few minutes later and he gets it all wrong. And so pay attention to this. Later in life, Peter says something really powerful. Later in life, Peter catches this vision and he's he's grown he's changed he's a different man he's matured he's in a completely different place in life he's now leading the church and he looks back on this time and he writes to christians and he gives them some words of encouragement and he starts with this dear friends do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you those words are pretty significant coming from him aren't they He can look back at a moment in his life when he was surprised and he responded inappropriately. And so now he's encouraging Christians who are tempted to fall away from Jesus. They're tempted to give up because of the the adversarial nature, because of the conflict that's facing them, because of persecution that's coming their way. They're tempted to give up. And Peter says, do not be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. Can I tell you that one of the biggest problems of the church today is that we get surprised too often. And we shouldn't. I hear Christians all the time say things like, I just can't believe people would live like that. I can't believe someone would make those kinds of decisions for their life. I just don't understand how in this country people would not follow Jesus. And it's like we've convinced ourselves that we're already living in his kingdom right here on earth. As if Jesus is already on the throne of everybody's hearts. And then we act surprised when people live contrary to that. Church, don't get surprised because when you get surprised, you respond the wrong ways. It's time that we begin recognizing that we're the strangers in this world, that we're the aliens, that we're the ones who aren't natural to this place. And if we aren't surprised, then we're more likely to respond appropriately. You see how this works? You see why this was so huge to Peter? Can you see how powerful this is that he would share this with Christians later in life? That we not be surprised by how this world works. Don't be surprised when the news says something contrary to Christianity. Don't be surprised when someone speaks against your faith or your beliefs. We live in a broken and fallen world. And if we get surprised, we respond like the world. We don't respond like Jesus. Be on your guard. Be prepared for these things. Peter takes all this and he kind of He jumps on a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's worth paying attention to. In verse 14, Peter moves on, and he says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, then that's that's great. You're blessed. Like bonus, right? Like good news. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. 
there's an interesting layout of truths here, okay? We live in a broken world where everyone's going to suffer at some point. Everyone's going to experience the lows in life. Everyone's going to experience the highs in life. And there's a sense in which our suffering is inevitable. Everybody's going to suffer at some point. That's not what Peter's talking about here. Peter is, is referencing the fact that sometimes our suffering is because we're stupid. Sometimes we're dumb. Sometimes we do things that are dumb. And we mess up. And then we suffer for it. And I've heard Christians claim that they're suffering because of the name of Jesus and their strugglings. And I listen closely and I think, I think you're just stupid. Like, I, I think you've just made some mistakes, and you're experiencing consequences. Now listen, this list that he gives is, is murderers and thieves and criminals and, and meddlers, which that's kind of a fun thing to think about, all right? But he gives this list of, of what it looks like to suffer not in the name of Jesus. I've heard people tell stories of, of broken relationships with their kids, broken relationships with friends, a tone that they receive in the workplace, and they blame it on their Christianity. They blame it, they, they claim to be persecuted and that they're suffering because of their faith. It's not always the case. Sometimes we suffer because we get it wrong. We do it poorly. We don't represent Jesus the way that we should. And it leads to sufferings. And so, so Peter wants us to be very clear. We're going to suffer in this world. Suffering's coming. For some of us, it's already here. But make sure that when you're suffering, you're suffering because of how close you are to Jesus. Jesus suffered. He was executed. So if we get too close to him, there's a decent chance that we're going to experience suffering in his name. And Peter says, that's blessing. Just know that it's coming. Don't be surprised. You should be able to anticipate it because it's coming. And then he moves on to this. Verse 17. He says, it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. That feels ominous. And he says, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, this is an interesting passage, all right? And, and there has been a perspective here where this word hard has been kind of the focus. Essentially, what, what we're seeing here is that salvation is kind of a, a fragile thing. That our relationship with God and what it is that Jesus has done for us, while powerful and incredible, it's still kind of fragile in the sense that, that it's hard for us to be saved. Peter's writing this to people who are thinking about backing off, people who are thinking about walking away. And the warning here is that if you walk away, you're losing something, you're leaving something behind. Now, the vast majority of interpretation on this verse has always focused on the righteous. It's always focused on the hard. It very rarely focuses on the other side, but I think that's where our focus ought to be. Because here's the reality. When we get this wrong, there's something to lose for us, but there's something greater to lose for our world. When we fight, we lose our light. You remember a couple weeks ago, Doc took that flashlight and he shined it in your eyes, and we all did the same thing. We all leaned back as if light couldn't make it you know, that far. All right? It's like we leaned back and turned our heads so that it wouldn't be too bright in our eyes, and it was offensive, it was painful, it was hurtful to our face. You remember that? And oftentimes what we do, when we get surprised by this world, we respond by fighting, we go after people thinking that somehow if we can win their heads, then eventually we'll win their hearts. And so we come after them and we become offensive, we become hurtful, and people actually get pushed away. People actually lean away from Jesus because of the harshness of the light. When we fight, we actually lose our light in the sense of something being appealing, something that would draw people in. We lose that. And the people who lose are the world. They lose access to light. And when we flight, we lose our salt. When we run, when we hide, the world loses the taste of the goodness of God. They lose access to, to, to the tastefulness, the, the deliciousness of life with God. They miss out on who he is because we've, we've retreated, we've hidden, we've pulled that flavoring away from them and they have to live without it. I mean, we have something to lose, but the world has something great to lose. They lose access to that. You see how that works? When we compromise, we lose Jesus. We just, we just kind of lose him altogether. We, we compromise with people over and over and over again until eventually you look around and you realize that you're not following Jesus anymore and Jesus hasn't been where you're at for a long time. What happens when we respond wrongly, the ultimate losers are the world. It's the people who don't know Christ. It's the ones outside of Christ. If the church is found to be lacking, it, Peter says that, 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 that there's going to be judgment. It's going to start with the church. 
And that in that judgment, if the church is found to be lacking, it's the world who loses. They lose their access to hope. Do you believe that? I mean, I would argue with God all day long on this. I can't believe that that was his best strategy. But it's the one he's chose. That the way in which people come to know who he is is through the church. That we would live lives of love in such a way that it would draw people in. Do you believe that? Do you see how much is on the line here? Do you believe it? That the only hope those outside of Christ have is the faithful work of the church? Do you believe? Do you believe that the only way people come to Christ is when we do our best imitation of Christ? Do you believe that the only way the world knows the love of God is when we live out the love of God? That's it. That's their only access to hope is how we live. And I think that's why I think that's why cowardice makes the list in Revelation 21. Peter goes on in verse 19. He says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should not commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. He starts by saying, do not be surprised, and he finishes by saying, continue to do good. If you like to write in your Bibles, I I love to encourage people to write in their Bibles. Maybe that offends you. We'll be fine, all right? But if you like to write your Bibles, if you like to highlight, circle, underline, any of that stuff, I want you to do that. I want you to circle that phrase at the beginning of this passage that says, uh, do not be surprised. And at the bottom, I want you to circle that little phrase um, that says, continue to do good. And I want you to like connect them and out on the side, I want you to write courage. That's what we're talking about today. That we not be surprised by what's happening in the world, but that we would be courageous enough that in the face of what's happening in the world that we would continue to do good. And I believe that is why this word cowardice exists in Revelation 21. That cowardice is the opposite of Jesus. It is the opposite of how he lived. It is the opposite of how he loved. And so the church needs confident and courageous, steadfast followers of Jesus who are willing to love the way that Jesus loved. And that takes courage. That takes an immense amount of courage. It takes a lot of courage to put aside your own preferences, doesn't it? I mean, what would it look like if you lived a life where you sacrificed what you wanted for what was best for Christ's kingdom? where you actually set aside your own preferences because you recognize that making a different decision would be better for Christ's kingdom. That takes courage. It takes courage to to bless those who don't agree with you. I mean, I know that you've got that neighbor who flies uh, different flags or who has different political yard signs in their yard. You've got that neighbor who lives differently than you, votes differently than you, thinks differently than you. What if you chose to bless them anyway? What if instead of trying to avoid them so there wouldn't be conflict, what if you actually found every way you could to just lavish the love of God on them? Wouldn't that be cool? It takes courage, though. It takes courage to love those who hate you. What if in your workplace, if you had a little bit of a reputation of being that religious person and everybody else was a little bit nervous around you and uncomfortable and some of them didn't even like you because of your beliefs? What if you just started buying them lunch? What if you got them presents for their birthday? What if you just loved people even though you weren't that popular? It takes courage to smile in the face of opposition. What if when you're walking down those halls at school and you see a kid who's getting bullied, you choose to just be his friend? And you know that it's going to put a target on your back, but you choose anyway to step in and smile in the face of opposition. It takes courage to hold your tongue to recognize that your actions will speak louder than your words, to choose to love people regardless of whether or not they hear your whole diatribe of what it is that you believe. It takes courage. And you know what's interesting is that we love Jesus for those things. We love that Jesus does all that stuff, but the church doesn't typically look very good at that stuff. Jesus' way of love is a way of extreme courage. In the early 1500s, there was a preacher by the name of Hugh Latimer. Hugh Latimer was, uh, was a pretty well-known guy, and he received an invitation from King Henry VIII. Maybe you remember him from history. Uh, he received an invitation to come and to preach to King Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII had a reputation as being someone who liked to decapitate people. Okay? And so if they said something they didn't like, they, they lived a certain way he didn't like, then he would just cut their heads off. He did it with a couple of his own wives. All right? And so this is, this is what's happening. Latimer receives this invitation, and he freaks out. Like, within him, he has this inner turmoil. He's nervous. He's scared. He wrestles with this idea, and he's very intimidated about the idea of having to stand before the king and preach truth to him. He knows that it could end poorly. 
But then in the midst of him working through that, I think he's praying through that. He comes to this realization that there's a day coming when he's going to stand in front of the king of kings and he's going to stand in front of the Lord of lords and that the king of England doesn't seem that big anymore. And he gains confidence and he goes and he preaches confidently and boldly to King Henry. Now, it's really cool. Henry doesn't kill him. So that's nice. However, he has this daughter. Her name was Queen Mary. Uh, history knows her as Bloody Mary. She didn't like him as much. And she eventually had him executed. She tied him to a stake, put wood around his feet, and lit it on fire. She didn't do it alone. He, he died next to one of his friends, uh, Bishop Radley. The two of them are burned at the stake. Now, history says that while they are on fire, like literally on fire, Latimer looks over to Ridley and he says this quote. He says, play the man. He says, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. Play the man. And I liked that phrase, but I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> All right? So I did some research and I looked into it. And that word, that, that phrase, play the man, it just means be courageous. Take courage. What's really cool is that years after this, the first English Bible is put into print. It's the King James Version. And there's a story in the Old Testament where literally translated out of the Septuagint, it should say, be courageous. And those first versions of the King James, they write, play the man. Be courageous. The church needs courageous people. People who are willing to fear God more than the flames. People who are willing to, to step forward that they would fear God more than their reputation. That we would be done with faint-hearted, tepid leadership but that we would recognize that the greatest courage we could possibly have is to look into the face of people who hate our guts and love them anyway. That's Jesus. And that's who we're called to follow. And that's what we're supposed to be. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the pressing forward in the face of fear. Maybe you've heard that one before. Ours is the day to play the man. It's time for this church to play the man and to be courageous.